In 2024, Oregon's bringing in its best recruiting class ever. Will the highest rated guys see the field? Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. So if you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you'll get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started we've got brian smith our locked on recruiting insider here on the show today doing some film breakdown which is perhaps amongst the many things what brian does best linkedin is of course our recruiting sponsor here at the network brian let's just hop right into it the the two kind of defensive gems for oregon in this recruiting cycle you can't actually know but based on rating the two highest rated guys are aiden breeland and elijah rushing they were five stars when they committed to oregon they're high four compi- like whatever. They're big time players, and, and everybody knows that. Let's let's start with Aiden Breeland. What can Oregon actually expect from a guy on the interior who comes in with with a lot of hype out of modern day high school? He got into really good shape over the last year or so. At one point, he was over three hundred pounds coming into high school, and he's kind of taken things to the next level with his nutrition, and he played at modern day. So you're talking about a kid that understood the whole concept of technique being prepared mentally, understanding scheme, who I'm going against, what to expect a double team, all those things you get at modern day. And now he's matured and kind of figured it out. If he doesn't play some, I'd be surprised. You and I were talking about Mateo before uh, this podcast and how many snaps he played. He was obviously ready as well. He played 38 snaps, the most in any one game, in like 280 or something like that for the year. It's hard for freshmen to play a lot, but Braden – is one of those rare kids that can do it. I bet he gets 200 snaps next season, and he'll be a rotational guy on the inside. You can't teach his athleticism at 285, 290 to go with all those other intangibles. Yeah, Mateo Uyungo, a 330 snaps as a true freshman, and he, like Breland, was a five-star when he committed to Oregon. He comes from the state of California. He lost a star once he got there, but it doesn't actually change the player himself. And, you know, it's – Hard to look at the defensive line with the way Dan Lanning and Tosh Lupoy and the staff treated it a year ago and, and really determine your starters other than maybe Jordan Birch and probably Jamari Caldwell, the Houston transfer. But even then, this is a very rotation heavy unit. And, and that's the way that you've seen teams do things in the SEC. Uh, Georgia in particular, it's the definition of embarrassment of riches. They have seasons where they have like one or two guys over 300 snaps on the D-line, which everybody else gets angry about. But that's called elite recruiting. That's it. They're they're not only rotating guys, they're dominating when they do it. They probably are the top five in the nation in three and outs again in power five football every year. That's why their snap counts are low. They maximize, they rotate their guys, and they get it done. That's how Alabama did it, et cetera. you got to be fresh at the end of the year if you're going to play like Alabama plays Auburn, then they turn around and play in the SEC title game. Georgia plays a pretty good opponent somewhere through there, then they play Georgia Tech, then the SEC title game. you got to have low snap counts. And that's what Lanning's trying to get to. They're close. They're not quite where they need to be, but that freshman group, that ridiculous number they had last year, as sophomores, you got to think 20% – maybe 30% more for some of those kids, you know, figured it out, the playbook and all that. And now you're you're able to get two or three more guys around the 250 mark. You don't necessarily have to play Mateo a ton more. He'll be a better player, but you save him for special games where he'll play 45 snaps. And then you can play him 15 against something, something state. That's, that's how you win in the SEC. And now Oregon joining the Big Ten, same kind of deal. For, for Aiden Breeland on the interior, I think he has a better chance than Elijah Rushing, who we're going to get to in, in, a, in a moment, to play more snaps because of the state of Oregon's interior, the D-line. You're losing Casey Rogers, Taki Taimani, Brandon Dorless, and Popo Amavai. Those are your top four defensive tackles. They bring in Jamari Caldwell from Houston, but I expect Breeland to be in the mix. But how ready is he going to be compared to 
you know, the guys from the 2023 class, the Johnny Bowens, Ramari Washingtons, Terrence Greens uh, of the world, and there are a bunch of other names in, in that group. There were 10 total defensive linemen in the 2023 recruiting cycle. We saw three of them last year, all at the edge position. All these interior guys redshirted. They've had a year in the weight room. They've had a year to learn the defensive system. How prepared is Breland to step in and push those guys for playing time when they're probably expecting to see a greater snap count? Well, I had expect at least one guy to probably bow out after the spring. Like somebody, I don't know who it's going to be. Somebody's going to think I'm not going to get enough snaps. But again, that's why you recruit that many kids. Whoever doesn't make it, doesn't make it. Breland's a good kid. I'm telling you, he's very mature from being around him. I, I met him at the Under Armour Orlando uh, football game. That's a great kid. He's a guy that's very motivated and has he's got the right place that he's coming from and being from modern day. He's going to walk in ready to play, unlike most freshmen. I'm not saying he's taking somebody's starting job or anything like that. But if he doesn't get 200 snaps, I'd be pretty disappointed because talent, size, mentality, all of it is right there. Let's move to Elijah Rushing, who, who's coming in at a much more loaded position group. And I talked about him on yesterday's show. I, I think comparison wise, I see him and I see elements of Kayvon Thibodeau positionally, the way he comes off the edge, the way that, you know, he's probably best standing up, but he can put one hand in the ground and, you know, just get after the quarterback. He's coming into a much more loaded position group because you've got Mateo Uyungle, Blake Purchase, Tatum Tuioti K. They all played last year. You've got Amarion Winston in that room. Okay. He he was a regular rotation guy for for the Ducks last season. He logged uh, 244 snaps. That was fifth most among amongst the edge defenders, and that includes Jordan Birch I into that mix. So when you look at rushing, right, I, I see similarities to Thibodeau. Nobody is Kayvon Thibodeau, of course, but how ready is he to contribute as a true freshman? I think he needs a little more time in the weight room for the run game. So I think him playing, it depends on the second part of the question. Are we talking about in the NASCAR package or first down and 10? I'm guessing it's going to be more of the former, not the latter. Uh, first down of 10, either you're able to take on a guy right through his chest or you're not. Not many 250-pound guys are ready for that when it's a 320-pound senior in front of them. You know, if you're playing Ohio State or Wisconsin or whatever team it is, they're going to have a massive man in front of you. But if they can put him in situations that's third and seven and he's not really worried about anything other than maybe a screen or a draw, he can play quite a few snaps. It's just good for him that he doesn't have to play a ton. When he goes in, he can just let it loose, play 15, 20 snaps a game and be done. Yeah, I, I think he could have a, a snap trajectory that maybe looks like what Tatum Tuioti's was a season ago. He saw the field for 256 snaps, according to PFF. 138 of them came in pass rushing situations. And I there think that's go. where rushing is the most capable. But you, you talked about, you know, being 250 and not necessarily being fully prepared to to take on the run. Why, why is that the case? Because isn't 6'6", 250 the sort of frame that you look for in, in a fully refined edge guy? The frame is one thing. The bench press numbers are another. The difference in the strength program after one year, like what a guy gains, he might put on 50 pounds bench or et cetera. Uh, to put it in, in perspective, Ruben Bain and one full semester went up over 100 pounds in his bench when he enrolled at Miami last year, over 100 pounds. And they ended up planting some inside at Miami, even though he's an edge rusher. When you get up to 400-pound bench, there's a lot of things you can do compared to when you're 250 on the bench. So I don't know how quickly Elijah is going to go up on those numbers, squat rack and the whole nine, but that's the difference. It's, it's not the frame. It's are you ready to just – Bend and, and just hold your ground when you get double teamed. Those duo plays are not friendly for a freshman. Those are the kind of plays that the, the, the C parts and then a running back goes for 80 yards. That's what they're trying to avoid. Got to hit the weight room and uh, eat your Wheaties. And I'm sure Oregon will, will <laughs> have him doing uh, both of those things. Two transfers that Oregon brought in that we're going to break down on the show. A corner and a receiver, one of which flies a little bit under the radar in this transfer portal class. 
FanDuel doesn't fly under anybody's radar, though, because you can get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. You can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Oregon's win total has been posted at FanDuel at 10.5, tied for the highest in the country with Ohio State, Georgia, and Texas. Not bad company. If you like Oregon over, or if you want to be conservative and bet the under, you can do whatever you want over at FanDuel. You can even bet individual games. Oregon minus one and a half at home against Ohio State is available right now if you feel good about it on FanDuel and hard to bet against the Ducks at Autzen Stadium. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, Brian, we've talked about a couple of high school recruits for Oregon in 2024, but the portal is, of course, a big part of of building a roster nowadays. Let's talk about a couple guys. We'll start on the defensive side of the ball since that's where uh, Oregon, I think, needs to improve the most from a season ago, particularly in the secondary. And I think when these conversations come up, and this includes my show, but on other ones as well, Sione Laulea is a guy that flies very much under the radar because Jabbar Muhammad is coming in from Washington and Cam Alexander from UTSA, Brandon Johnson from Duke, Kobe Savage from Kansas State. But Laulea is not listed in the transfer portal class, but to me he is because he's a junior college transfer. So he played for two years at the JUCO level. He comes out highly, highly touted junior college prospect. And by the way, the last former JUCO corner that Oregon brought in was Kyrie Jackson, who was at a JUCO before he went to Alabama. He's now getting, you know, mid-round draft grades in, in the NFL. So Lale is another piece in the secondary that makes me feel really good about Oregon's depth. What do you see from him on film? Size and length. Uh, that's a kid that's got the ability to make plays as a boundary corner, which is hard. I think he could play free safety if you wanted him to, and he could do a lot of different things in space. How many guys are you going to get like that just coming out of the Juco ranks that can play early? That's That's the question I have. Oregon, I mean, they scored so much last year. They could get away with something going wrong on defense most of the time. But if you're going to take that stop, that next step and beat Georgia or beat Ohio State or Texas or something in this year's playoff, and Oregon's right there with them, they're going to need somebody else to kind of be that guy. Maybe he's it. Maybe there's another guy that can help. But you need as many, kind of like with the defensive line with Lanning, they need a lot of guys that can get after it and make plays in the secondary. How many guys do you feel like right now that you would say coming into this season for the Ducks are an NFL first or second round pick at corner? Muhammad. You need you need at least two based on recent history. It's just do you like after 2016, Washington, Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, they were the four playoff teams. Every one of them had a first or second round pick, if not multiple, the next spring. It's insane at corner. If you do not have NFL talent at corner, the chances of winning a title are very, very low. And, I mean, Oregon's got a good defense, but just adding that one more piece might be the difference between getting into the final game or not even winning a playoff game. So maybe this is the guy. Again, unique pieces like this, too. He could match up with some big guy, and that that always helps. There's nothing worse than knowing the, the boundary guy over there on third and eight they can throw a jump ball to, and there's not much you can do about it. So – that, that's my guess on what Lanning likes about him, and I know I do too. Yeah, so you, you mentioned something really interesting, and that's you could that's that you could see him playing free safety. And the reason that that caught my attention, I imagine the eyes and ears of anybody listening to or watching this right now who's been in tune with this sort of stuff is that Oregon's safety depth is nowhere near as strong as its cornerback depth. You can go okay. too deep across the board. You can go Muhammad and Manning at uh, you know at boundary corner. You could go Florence and Alexander field corner. You can go Johnson and Reed at nickel. But at safety, you've got Kobe Savage, Kansas State transfer. You, you've got uh, Taishim Johnson coming back. John, and then Brandon Johnson is, is you know kind of that nickel spot of that third position. But the, 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 you know, I've talked on this show before about, hey, could Aaron Flowers play as a true freshman? Or is Tyler Turner or Cody DeCambra from the 2023 class, are, are they going to pop uh, on the back end and, and see some real playing time? Why do you look at Laulea and say he could play free safety? Length. He just fits the profile, just like the body type. That doesn't mean 
that he's a guy that's going to be back there directing the whole deal. I have no idea. Safety is very, very hard at right. the college and pro level now. Let me be very clear. I'm talking about physical traits. He may not even have an interest in it. Now, if Dan walks up to him and says, hey, we're really short. So-and-so's banged up this week. We may need five to ten snaps from you there. we got to get you up to speed. It is what it is. But I, I'm sure they would at least take a look at it in spring ball because you want to play devil's, devil's advocate. Okay, we're good, but what if this happens? We need to be prepared next year. And spring ball is where you try those things. A running back might play some safety this spring. I doubt you guys will be there in the media to see that in practice. But they, you try those things to find out if there's another way to make this work, especially if it's like the last position to get over the top. Again, the receivers and stuff in college football are so good now, safety is hard. They're putting a lot of one-on-one -on -one spots. So if you can take a corner and move them to safety, it's a good – it's one of the things Florida State did in the late 90s. By the way, they were really good then. They recruited all corners and moved guys to safety unless a guy was like a five-star. They just recruited corners. And they were winning 10-plus games a year doing it. It's a pretty good philosophy. Yeah, not bad. I, I think of Triquez Bridges, who, who has transferred to Florida this offseason. He was a safety when he came to Oregon. He moved to corner, and there was always discussion in you know the media and fan world of, well, could he move back to safety because Oregon doesn't doesn't have the depth. So I'm curious to see what happens there with, with yeah. Laulea. Let's go to the other side of the ball and talk about another transfer for the Ducks. Evan Stewart, one most Duck fans probably know by now, former five-star recruit, grades as a five-star transfer on 24-7, coming from Texas A&M. Two solidly productive years with the Aggies, but it definitely feels to me like he's got another gear, and I think he comes in and is Oregon's number one receiver. At least that's what he's capable of. He's one of the few kids that I've ever seen – that runs hot like he does. He's a kid that's very emotional, but when he's in his zone, he could just dominate anybody. Like his technique is tremendous. He was, there's a guy named Hooks in Dallas that he trained with. Before he got out of high school, he was better than a lot of college kids technically. And then the speed and change of direction and all that were just God given. He could be a 75 catch guy, no problem next year. I don't know how it's going to work out because they're going to spread the ball around. I happen to know the quarterback that's going to the Ducks. He's a great guy, and he'll throw it to whoever's open. But if they start to connect, the 75 will be a low total. He'll throw it up. He likes to throw the 50-50 ball down the field. Stewart is phenomenal at that. He's going to make an impact. I don't care if it's Ohio State's corners. I don't care who it is. Not a lot of guys are going to cover him. And he's finally going to be, I, at least I hope for him, playing for a quarterback that stays healthy. A&M had so many problems the last couple of years. Stewart's numbers – don't give him any kind of justification. I'm telling you, that is an NFL player. He'll be at Oregon one year, and he'll be in the NFL. So you think he is for sure gone after 2024? And barring this, again, something goofy happening at quarterback, yeah. Like, okay. His talent is ridiculous, and he's very, very motivated. Yeah, well, that that's more than a little interesting because that means, you know, if that is correct, and I'm inclined to take your word for it since you tend to know what you're talking about. That's why we bring him on the show, everybody. That would put Oregon out their top four receivers, Oof. at least where it looks like now, going into 2025, which is crazy. But you, you'd have Stewart, Treshawn Holden, Gary Bryant, Tez Johnson out of eligibility. If Stewart's gone as well, that could be a completely revamped receiver room uh, the following year. The portal will certainly come into play, but that could also be an opportunity for guys like Jerion Dickey or Kyler Casper, Jeremiah McClellan, Ryan Pelham, uh, Dallas Wilson and the like to, to have a big role that year. But on Stewart, you know, he, he's someone that comes with a lot of attention and hype and whatnot. Troy Franklin was the number one receiver for Oregon last year. He was great taking the top off the defense, but he could also work the short and intermediate stuff. Where does Evan Stewart rank in, in your mind in that ability to, to not just be a guy who's super fast taking 50-50 balls? He does the best work when he turns guys around. He's the one that will YouTube somebody before he touches the football. That, I mean, he's – look, he put in the time. Hooks is the guy I'm talking about. He's the trainer up there. Then he played at a good program too. The whole nine yards, he was focused on his craft. This is what I'm doing. In the 7 to 12-yard range in the middle of the field where it's hard for quarterbacks and they're a little nervous because there's more hands trying to get to the ball, Evan finds a way to get open. He is the annoying guy on third and seven that gets eight yards. And, it, and I mean, he could go over the top. Don't get me wrong. But you're going to make your money literally and, you know, 
philosophically speaking, if you can play in the middle of the field and take hits and catch the football, you got to do that at the NFL level because you're not just going over the top in the NFL. The guys are too good. He's that guy. Tremendous hands when it is a contested catch opportunity. Oregon and everybody needs that. You know, I, I don't care if Troy was coming back. You would still take Evan Stewart. So, obviously, with him gone, I mean, is he going to catch as many balls? Is Troy? No. I, 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 that, that's kind of hard to – project but like 75 i think is an easy number for him if he's as motivated as he's always been why wouldn't he today's episode of locked on ducks is brought to you by game time game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports music comedy and theater events near you and right now all users get 100 off when you buy a big game ticket with code vegas 100 with killer last minute deals all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. They've got last-minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals, everything you need to get tickets at any point in time. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event, even an hour after it starts. It's the place to find last-minute seats, and they give you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You buy tickets in just seconds with two Taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Right now, all Game Time users get $100 off a big game ticket with code VEGAS100. Terms apply. Just download the Game Time app. Use code VEGAS100 for $100 off a big game ticket. Or if you're not going to the game, use code LOCKED ON for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Well, truth be told, everybody, I almost forgot, but then I didn't forget. Oregon's got a new commit in the 2025 recruiting cycle, Matthew Johnson. I couldn't let Brian go without asking him about the first defensive commitment of Oregon's next recruiting class. De La Salle High School product, edge player. Brian, what can you tell Oregon fans about Matthew Johnson? Well, he played a lot of three and one tech for De La Salle. They got a lot of guys. 6'5", very long, 260. He's in phenomenal shape, and the way he uses his hands and mixes up his moves, he's what you would expect from De La Salle, a guy that takes to his craft, doesn't just mess around and use one move and try to over-talent people. He uses smarts as much as physical ability to get to the quarterback and the running back, and he can play all over the D-line. I don't really think he has a position, which is normally bad, but in his case, you can just move him around. He can play one, three, or five. And with his length, that's a good thing, especially when you're in the NASCAR package and it's third and seven. You don't know where he's going to line up. Hypothetically speaking, this is a guy that Lanning could use in multiple places to make big plays. So his frame comes in about you know, 6'5", 2, 240-ish in, in that sort of range. When you're talking you know, 1, 3, and 5 and the different techniques and whatnot, explain for people who might not know what all of those things entail. He's listed at 260 on his huddle. How accurate that is, I don't know. He's put together. That I'll tell you. One means nose guard. Three is D-tackle. Five is strong side defensive end. The numbers I've just got used to from being around coaches, but they're usually put together with a 4-3 line, which about half the NFL teams run. If you hear zero tech, that means it's a three-man line, and you got the big nose guard just right in front of the center. Those are the easiest ways to define it. But again, it's totally different being a one, which is just shaded to the inside or outside of the center, to the strong side and being a five tech. That's a world apart, even though it's only a couple of gaps, the kind of guys you go against, etc. Having a body that is proven athletically to be able to play at either spot is rare. If he's truly around 260, and I think he is, he'll probably play at 280 or so at Oregon. Maybe on goal line, he plays on the edge on third downs or something like that, maybe in specialty situation. And then the rest of the time as a pass rusher on the interior, I think he'll end up being a three tech most of the time. But maybe they put him on the nose on third and eight, make the center hike the ball with a really athletic guy in front of them. Those are the games that Lanning knows how to play after he's been at Bama, Georgia, et cetera. And it's a chess piece. It's one that's really unique and Ducks fans are going to enjoy. So versatility is the name of his game. Last guy that, you know, I really think of in college football when you're talking versatility was Isaiah Simmons. And he's okay. kind of struggled in the NFL because – well, he played a little defensive end, he played a little linebacker, he played a little safety, and then he got to the NFL, and he wasn't good enough at any of those spots to live up to his full athletic potential. When you look at Johnson, where does he maximize his potential? Three tech. I think as a general rule, 25, 30 pounds is what you're going to gain. He's at least 250, 
and I'm, he says he's 260 based on huddle. I'm guessing he's going to play at 280 or so and try to cut himself off in that range to keep his quickness. But he's got a bevy of different moves because, again, he's from De La Salle. He'll be able to use those better at that spot where he's going to get fewer double teams than he would playing nose guard. Brian Smith, Locked On Recruiting Insider here at the network, brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Appreciate you stopping by. All the film breakdown you could ever want, everybody. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much, sir. So as we pivot to basketball here, unfortunately, Oregon is going to, in all likelihood, go forward without Nate Biddle. And that's a bummer because Biddle came on at the end of last year, and he was someone who I was so excited to watch this season. And then he suffered a wrist injury, and now I don't know if that's flared up, but the illness he's dealing with is reportedly going to keep him out for quite a while. I, I don't really know everything that's going on. I don't know that anybody knows everything that's going on there, but Oregon has to operate as if they don't have Biddle available and that they won't. And he's just a mega talent. You know, hopefully he comes back and is healthy for the Ducks next year because Enfali Dante is out of eligibility after this season. But here's, here's where I'm at with Oregon. When I think about Nate Biddle and what I wanted him to be, that is what Kwame Evans Jr. or KJ Evans now has to be. And that is a big who can be a five in in spots when Dante is not on the court. Because Mo Diawara, who filled in just beyond admirably while both Dante and Biddle were out and gave Oregon everything he could, really what they ended up doing in those rotations was they would start with, with, with Mo Diawara at the five, but then at the end of the game, KJ Evans was playing the five. And, and sometimes... I think Evans is going to have to do that. And Evans is a guy who can score inside and out. He can hit the mid range. He can shoot the three a little bit. You know, he's still progressing in that sense. He's 28% from beyond the arc this year. You'd like to see him get that, you know, into the low to mid 30s, but that might be something that evolves over the course of his Oregon career. But I think as it pertains to this season, the best five Oregon can put on the floor is Shellstad, Kuznard, probably Tracy, Evans. And Dante. I think that's the five who in crunch time are going to be out there. You know, sometimes maybe it'll be Brennan Rigsby instead of Bam Tracy, but I, I, th I think Tracy provides good length. He can score inside. He shot the ball well this season. I think that he, he's he been really, really good. But w without Biddle, this is the moment in, in which Evans, you know, once again, has to really step up because if you're not going to have that size inside with, with with Biddle, who's seven feet tall, then you need someone who can come in and, and be a defensive presence and an offensive presence when when Dante isn't out there. And so the thing about Mo Diawara is he can bring it defensively a little bit. He can rebound. He's a big body. But offensively, unless you're giving him a wide open dunk, he's not going to give you anything. That, that's you know not what he's brought in for. It's not what he can do. Evans can give you that. So I think this is really an opportunity for, for, for Evans to blossom and, and thrive and, and play a bigger role without Biddle in the fold. And I hope that he is given that opportunity. And, and you know, I, I've talked earlier this week on the show about, you know, and, and Folly Dante and working him into the offense, but not running it straight through him and being reliant on him or anything like that. I think that Biddle being out the rest of the year could be great for for Kwame Evans Jr. And Oregon needs him to be great. O Oregon needs him to be able to play the five a little bit when Dante's on the bench, or they need him to, you know, hit some threes or score some points. You know, he had a game recently, I forget if, I think it was against Wazoo, and the, the last time out the Ducks played, where he had 15 points in like 18 to 20 minutes of action. I, I mean, he, he was really, really good. I'm going to double check that real quick. But, you know, he, he has had flashes of the potential he's one of the highest rated recruits uh in in oregon history and he uh you know had just five points against wazoo the win against washington he had 15 points in 24 minutes and he only hit one three that's what that's the sort of potential that oregon needs because when you know i was waiting for biddle to come back that's what i was thinking biddle would be able to provide size scoring shot blocking but i've seen evans do those things and, and he's the guy who I think most is going to have to step up. But Oregon's got to be able to find the right combination of offense and defense. I mean, their defense almost blew it against Washington. They hung on for the win. Their offense let them down against Washington State, but the defense played well. If they defend the way they did against the Cougs, who are a really good team, and they you know have got some really talented offensive players, 
If you hold teams under 70 points, you should be able to win regularly, especially at home. But Oregon State is up next on Saturday. The Beavs have pulled an upset of Arizona this year, and they beat somebody else uh, who's good as well. But they have not been great overall. And Oregon should win the game. And Oregon plays the Beavs twice in the next four. They've got the Bay Area schools next week, and then Oregon State comes to Eugene. And then the final three games of the year are Arizona, Colorado, and Utah. And that'll end up defining Oregon season. Whether or not they get to the tournament, and I, I know that you know those of you that are basketball fans out there are asking questions about Dana Altman. I think that's completely fair. I don't think you can ask them and have the full discussion until you see how this season plays out. Because Dana's teams historically have played their best basketball at the end of the year, and they start to really figure it out and go on a run, but that hasn't necessarily been the case the last couple of weeks. But if that kicks into gear right now, you never know. You, you, you just never know, but that's where things stand. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and as always, go Ducks.